Uh, the Global Vascular Guidelines is a combined effort from the Society for Vascular Surgery, the European Society for Vascular Surgery, and the World Federation of Vascular Societies, who have all independently done guidelines in the past, but to do guidelines jointly. And the very first and most important project that we undertook was advanced limb ischemia, which we're calling chronic limb-threatening ischemia. We've changed the terminology around this problem to recognize the fact that in current practice, what constitutes limb-threatening ischemia may be different in different scenarios. Uh, the concept that was previously critical limb ischemia suggested there's some threshold value of perfusion below which everyone is critical and above which everyone is okay. And so what we've realized is that with diabetes and the, you know, the expanding range of neuroischemia that we see in patients, that uh, more moderate ischemia may still be limb-threatening in certain situations when there are large wounds and bad infections. So, and in current vascular practice, we are treating more of those patients. So I think in current times, to pretend that there's a critical measurement that we could say defines critical is really not reality. So instead, we prefer the, the name chronic to denote something that's present for at least two weeks. Chronic limb-threatening ischemia describes the whole spectrum of wounds, ischemia, and foot infection. There's a lot of new things in the guidelines, starting with the terminology and the definitions of what, who's the target population for the guideline which includes a very broad range of people with wounds on their lower leg for at least two weeks in various degrees of ischemia. We are particularly espousing the concept of evidence-based revascularization. And to do that, we are creating a new framework of decision-making that starts with the patient and then looks at staging the limb and only then looks at staging the vascular anatomy. We call this the plan, patient limb anatomy scheme. And so what's new here is that we're creating or promoting careful staging of the patient for their risk, of the limb using Wi-Fi or something like it, and of anatomy using a different system which we're proposing in this guideline that actually integrates the complexity of revascularization from the groin all the way to the foot rather than segment by segment. And we think with that decision matrix, uh, we can both look at the current evidence, but more importantly, do research to generate new evidence that's more in line with the way we think about coronary disease single, double, and triple vessel disease with or without a poor ventricle, we don't have that lexicon in our field. And, and so we need to get there to design our trials and look at our evidence properly. The new guideline is stressing a structured approach to decision making, which starts with the patient and then goes to staging the limb and then only then goes to talking about vascular anatomy. This is, we felt is very important because we think over the last number of years with the evolution of technology, uh, there's been an overemphasis on lesions, vascular lesions, and to the detriment of thinking about the patient and the limb first. So in this system, you know, we have an approach that starts with assessing the risk of the patient, both their perioperative risk, their long-term survival, and also their ambulatory function and their goals for treatment. That clearly is the first thing. The second is to stage the limb. First, is it salvageable at all? And, and then if it is salvageable, using a system like the SVS Wi-Fi, how threatened is it based on looking not just at the ischemia, but also at the wound and the presence of infection? And with that system, I think we can show from available data that it pretty well segregates patients at different risk of major amputation into three or four groups. Uh, in the current system, there's four, four stages of Wi-Fi. So stage the limb next. Once you know how severely threatened the limb is, the next stage, and whether the patient's a candidate for revascularization, you look at vascular anatomy. And in the new guideline, we're proposing a new way to, to stage the vascular anatomy that really is more in line with the way we think in treating CLTI, which is how do we restore inline flow from the groin all the way to the foot? Not one lesion at a time, but to get it all the way there. And often in these patients, that means crossing more than one lesion because most of them have multi-segment disease. And the outcomes are, are a multiplier of each other. You know, they're not one at a time. So in this system, what we've done is uh, defined a couple of things. One, what we're calling the target artery path. So when you have an angiogram, 
the surgeon or interventionalist decides which is their primary below the knee target that they're trying to get open all the way to the foot. And then if you take a line and draw from the groin through the target artery to the foot, you can define a complexity of that pathway based on the location, length, and severity of stenosis or occlusions, which by consensus we then grouped into three categories. Low complexity, very favorable for endovascular approach, and this is all based on an, on an endovascular mindset. And high complexity, uh, you know, we're very technically challenging for an endovascular approach where, for example, technical failure rates may be higher and durability may be poor and an intermediate group. And so if you then take anatomic complexity, say, on a y-axis and limb stage on an x-axis, you have a matrix through which I think you can begin to create the best preferred option for an individual patient. And that's the framework that we are pushing forward in the guideline. There was always disagreement about the strength of evidence that might support some of the previous guidelines. And what should, should the guidelines follow practice or should the guidelines follow evidence? And should evidence guide practice? Those are two very different things because marketing drives practice sometimes. And uh, I think there was a retooling to think more about evidence. We have a lot of areas in this field where we don't have level one evidence. Uh, in our guideline, there are a small fraction of our recommendations that are high level grading in terms of strength and evidence, and there are many others that are weaker, and there are some areas where they're simply just good practice statements. Um, we highlight areas that are areas of unmet research uh, in the field, and we hope that funding agencies will pay attention, as well as industry, to sort of fill those gaps. In areas where there's not high level of evidence, there was a lot of consensus building in the course of generating these recommendations. So in some cases, we used Delphi approaches where we asked individuals to fill in a grid of answers. In other cases, we just had conventional debate and discussion, uh, either by phone meetings or in-person meetings to generate a recommendation. And finally, there are a couple of areas that the guidelines will show where we literally have just said it's indeterminate for this type of patient, which approach might be best? Um, frankly, it's, there's no consensus in some of these cases. So I think the new guideline reflects the best evidence that we have, which is that in contemporary practice, these have complementary roles, not competing roles. Uh, and so it's pretty clear, I think, from looking at the evidence and as reflected in the recent ESC and ESVS guideline, that if you have a standard risk patient who has a good available vein, who has very complex vascular anatomy with long occlusions, and particularly if they have a very threatened limb, that those patients do better with a bypass first. There are many other patients who have less complex anatomy, minor ulcers or less severe tissue loss, who might be best served by endo first, and there's a wide gap in between where we really don't know and we'll be looking for best CLI and basal to help us with all of that. I think in contemporary practice, I think most of us recognize that endo and open have complementary roles for revascularization in these patients. The question is, you know, which proportion of patients are best served by which, and what's the right thing at the right time for each patient. And I think what if you look at current data from national registries, including in the U.S. from the VQI, actually our data suggests that about 30% of patients are still getting a bypass first. Um, if you look at the German registry, it was about 20%. So I think the right proportion is probably about 25% of patients will present who are reasonable risk for surgery, have very complex anatomy that doesn't do well with endovascular, uh, long lesions, long occlusions, and have more severe limb threat. I think those patients really can't afford an initial failure. They do poorly if their first revascularization fails. And I think doing the, you know, doing the best procedure first matters for some of those patients. You don't get a second shot or they lose more tissue and they really suffer the consequences. So I believe it's gonna be that right now with the current technology, it's about anywhere from 20% to maybe a third of patients, but it's a guess. I think it's dead. 
I think it's dead to say that that's the best approach for all patients. It actually is insulting. Insulting and mindless. There will be criticisms that the staging systems that are being proposed, both Wi-Fi and the new anatomy system called GLASS for Global Limb Anatomy Staging System, have not been prospectively validated. Neither was TASC when it first came out, neither were many cancer systems when they first came out. People sit down and they think about the problem and they think about what makes sense in terms of how to group it and then when we get more data, the staging system should be modified to address prospective data. There probably will also be criticism that it doesn't represent every professional society from all specialties uh, in, in the world. So it does represent all specialties because we have all types of specialties as writers on this guideline. There are 57 or 58 authors uh, from vascular surgery, interventional cardiology, interventional radiology, podiatry, vascular medicine. But the sponsoring societies have been the primary sponsors involved in the iterative rounds of review. We will be asking other professional societies to review and potentially endorse this guideline once we finish the process of review and public comment. And we will be inviting all those societies to review it during the public comment period. Uh, but they have not been involved from the, you know, from the beginning of the process as full sponsoring societies. So that may be another area where people will criticize. But I would finalize by saying that the community of the vascular surgery societies represented by this around the entire world is a large number of providers taking care of a large number, if not the majority of patients with CLTI. So we have to start somewhere in terms of generating evidence-based practice and creating a new thought process. And I think, you know, we can't build Rome in a day. So that was our compromise.